Hello everyone, I'm Charles Brown, Portfolio Manager with CB3 Financial. We're glad you're with us for Retirement Realities. The episode now is episode three. How much nest egg is enough? The question everybody wants to know. And of course that's different for everyone, but we'll look into that in this program. This series is taken from the book, Not Your Father's Retirement, written by myself and Dr. Dave Gursky. The purpose of our book is to explain why retirement in our generation, most of the people watching this are baby boomers, our retirement is not like what our parents had for many reasons, which we're covering throughout this series. So if you're new to us, we'd like you to go to YouTube. If you're watching us there now, you probably are, unless you see us on Facebook. And subscribe to our channel and click the little bell so that you get notified when a new episode is published, like this Evergreen series, which is called Retirement Realities. We also have a financial program, CB3 Live, the Monday Market Mashup, uh, the One Minute Wisdom Program, uh, CB3 Wealth Wisdom, and we're actually continually adding new educational ideas because education is really important to us here at CB3 Financial. And we hope that you'll join us for those other programs as well. But for tonight or today, whenever you happen to be watching this, how big a nest egg do you need? Well, the reality is if you master the psychological challenges, and remember, I wrote this book with Dr. Dave Gursky, who is a psychologist been doing this for decades and you know even if you have the psychological preparing and you don't have the financial preparing you need both uh, as one of the couples that we interviewed for our book said to us and we use this quote several times and I'm going to use it tonight you know it's really tough to spoil the grandchildren when you have to live with them now I know that some grandparents choose to live with their children and their grandchildren. In fact, uh, I know somebody pretty close to me that's doing that. Um, but that's a choice. It's not something that they had to do. So it's important to realize that many times, the way society is here in America, if a, if a couple retires, uh, a widow has a much tougher time surviving alone than a man does. Part of that is because that pensions are structured. And I realize that pensions are on the way out. Less and less people, the next generation will hardly have them at all, except in the public sector. But pensions are structured for the payout to be a single payout. Now, you can request a joint payout. And certainly when we advise people that are still working and can make that choice before the pension is annuitized uh, to take a joint payout, but we've known several people, not clients of ours, because we would never advise this, who took the sole payout and that beneficiary died and left the other spouse basically in a terrible situation. So you have to understand that, you have to understand lifespans, which also we'll get into later in here. But basically, if you're traveling to a certain place, I want to be retired or at least away from my full-time job by this date. I want this amount of money saved. It's a real simple thing to think about, but I just want to encourage you. If you're trying to get to Los Angeles, you can't get there on the Mississippi River. You can travel as long and hard and thoughtful as you want, but you're simply never going to reach Los Angeles. And you can put your city of destination there uh, if you'd like, but the reality is that you just have to head in a certain direction. That means you need tools. That means you need to get rid of your deficit lifestyle. Now, that's how we open this series, talking about people that are still living a deficit lifestyle. It's a phrase I coined, I think. Uh, basically, a deficit lifestyle is spending more than you're making. So ideally, you want to set 10% aside at the beginning. Now, if, it's just, you know, if you're doing this in your 50s, you can start now, but you, I'm hoping you've been doing this most of your life. 10% aside for philanthropic or charity because it's just the right thing to do, and it also disciplines you for the next 90%. That next 10% after that should be saved. It could be in 401ks and Roths, uh, obviously, you know, non-qualified accounts, we can get into that. We will get into that more later on. But always pay yourself first, okay? And then live on the remaining 80%. That's the way to be fiscally responsible. 57% of retirees today, and this is the data that we pulled in our book, said that they expect to retire at 65, and yet only 37, a little over one-third, have calculated how much they actually will need in retirement. That is not good. What that means is they're using their intuition 
to figure out how much they need to live on in retirement. And my position has always been that if you use your intuition in many ways and in many instances, it can end up being into wishing. Intuition versus into wishing. Don't just be into wishing that you're going to be prepared financially. All right. So what is the path? What are you guys and what are we all going to do in our generation that's different than what our parents did? First of all, money touches all aspects of our life. It's not just what we spend day to day. We save it. We spend it on electric and mortgages and things that we need. We spend it on discretionary items, things that we don't need. You know, if we have a surplus, we're able to buy things that make us happy, that are not necessarily things that we need. One thing we've discovered is that during a, you know, a shortage or this last pandemic, People don't buy, on rare occasions anyway, more toilet paper than they need. Now, I realize that the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic caused that to be different. But that's still, you're just not going to get excited by a raise and go out and buy more shaving cream or soap or other you know, items like that. You're going to buy discretionary items. And you want to be able to set yourself up for retirement where you can enjoy those items and you're not counting every dollar. I've always said that money really should be like oxygen. So in this particular podcast, in this episode, I've had a certain number of breaths. I don't know how many breaths I've had. You've had a certain number of breaths watching this episode. We don't know how many that is. And the reason is it doesn't matter. Now, if you have too much nitrogen in the air, you're going to feel it. You're going to have burning sensation in your lungs. And obviously, if you don't have enough air, that's a very, very different and serious problem. So either too much or too little air, so to speak, is a problem. But when you don't notice it, it's about right. And money's the same way. You have too much and you end up being like Charlie Sheen or some other uh, Hollywood stars that have just abused it. You know the people that are just consumed by money. And if you don't have enough, then you don't have margin in your life and you're not able to do the things that you really want to do. We're trying to find that sweet spot where you have enough to do what you want to do, but you're not really thinking about money day to day. We do know that money is usually the biggest challenge that couples face. And there's really only two outcomes. That's what our research said. Any decision that you make in a marriage, and it's not just about money, but other things too. It could be children, it could be grandchildren, it could be sex, it can be money, but there's only two outcomes when you're working on a decision together. And what that means is it's going to be a decision that draws you closer in your relationship or it's going to draw you farther apart. And as I said on previous episodes, nothing more so than money pushes couples apart. You really have to be careful and watch this, okay? We're going to show you the positive side of this. We're going to show you how you can sit down, create budgets, create expectations for what you want, and to write it out. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to actually write down your goals. Now, I know this you've seen this so many times out there. Write it down, write it down, write down your journal, write down your dreams, right? Well, but it's just true because it becomes real when you see it on paper. Now, that doesn't mean you have to physically get out a piece of paper. You want to do it in a word processor? That's fine. Make sure both spouses have a copy of it. And I would say hit print and put it up on the refrigerator, especially if you're new in this process. Okay, so what is it that gets you guys excited? What is it that you're defining as your retirement? Again, it's about planning. And if you have goals that, well, gosh, I thought when we quit, we would be doing this. Well, what if I quit my job first and you're still working? Well, don't just let, let that happen on a Friday when you get your last paycheck. And it's like, now what are we going to do? Think about these things starting today. It's really, really important, okay? Okay. Our parents wanted a retirement where they could have adventures, and that really satisfied them. Candidly, I think it left many of them empty because just having adventures day after day after day gets old. Our generation is going to want quests. A quest is something that makes you feel like you're contributing back to society and benefits others besides yourself. The retirement reality that we're talking about here is not your father's retirement, and we'll see you next time.